Hey everybody, welcome to Let's Play, and today we're going to be talking about the writing for Tales of Kinzara Zhao with its creative director, who you may also know from HBO's Raised by Wolves, its father, most recently as Alan of Hull in the new season of House of the Dragon, and also as the voice of Bayak from Assassin's Creed Origin. Abu Bakr Salam, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. Thank you for having me. This is, this is really exciting. First of all, I want to say congrats on the game. I did just... Um, I did just uh, finish it. Well, not just finished. I finished it about a month ago, but it's still like kind of resonating <laughs> with me. Thank you. Um, I'm a big like Metroidvania fan, but I think like what it adds to the genre is like how yeah. committed it is to its story and how like all the aspects of like the world building and the character progression kind of like fit in yeah. with like the yeah. gameplay mechanics. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, no, it was, <laughs> to be honest, it was one of those ones where I was just like, yeah, I, I don't you know with with you know this is our first game first studio that kind of thing and you know it, we really wanted to ensure that we provided a solid experience but at the same time something that you know stays with you and i think like whenever you're like judging like what <clears throat> sort of what you can play with and what you can't play with like where do you want to take the risk on we were like let's let's you know really be a bit bolder with story more so than anything else because I think like that's the one thing that we had ultimate control over. Yeah, and with that, do you mind if we start just with like some of the background of like um, where the idea for the game came from, and also like why you mm. decided to tell the story as a game? So it it was inspired by um, the loss of my father. Um, so I lost my dad ten years ago to cancer, and um, I th I've been reading really ever since and i've been trying to figure out like the best way of processing that and dealing with that and <clears throat> you know I'd, I'd gone through the the whole like oh, i'm gonna make it into you know a tv show or write it into a play or whatever but nothing really felt genuine um it didn't feel real like the right way and it was only until um four years ago when i was with um i was i was doing raised by wolves and i was playing um Ori in the Blind Forest on the Switch, and <clears throat> there's a section in this in, in in the actual game where it's incredibly difficult, and it made me real. It, it reminded me of a point playing with my father um, on the Mega Drive uh, Sonic, which was also an incredibly difficult level, and that feeling of elation when you complete it. And I remember just that moment of being like, ah, this needs to be a game. Like I need to share this story as a video game. And so, yeah, four years ago, literally it was just like a moment of like that element clicked in and afterwards everything just made sense. You know, picking the genre, the story, the, you know, the, the way I wanted to tell the story, like it just all sort of, um, came as one in that moment of like, yeah, this needs to be a game. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I think it's like an amazing tribute. Thank you. And like, obviously like grief is a very personal thing. And I'm just curious, like how you decided to kind of take that concept, take your, like your own personal experience with it and transfer it into like, uh, for something for like a wider audience. Yeah. I think for me, it was just like, you know, throughout this journey, I've been figuring out or, 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 or I've been exposed to other ways of how grief has been depicted and nothing felt honest. Not that it didn't feel honest, but it just didn't feel real to me. And it didn't feel, it felt like it was like a, a small, a small shade of it. It's always either really sad or always like, it felt like the surface level in a way. And it didn't feel like raw. And I think like for me, it was like, yeah, grief in itself is a, is a sad thing, right? You think about it as sad, but the actual journey is so much more complex. And I really wanted to depict that through an experience rather than necessarily telling people. And that's kind of what led the design of the game was to feel that journey, that element of, 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 of the complexity of it. Um, <clears throat> even though it's the, sim the simple element of grief is you just have to keep going, you know, you just have to move forward. So yeah, that's really what sort of, you know, sparked me to 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 look at it and, and and kind of depict it was this sense of this need to convey something that felt you know like the fact that 
grief, you know, as I said, like grief isn't always sad. There's, you know, there's elements of confusion. There's also weird elements of, of peace and elation. And I think like that's what was really important for me to, um, to depict through the game. It's this continuous movement, which you cannot stop. Even you move, even the steps backwards that you feel that you're taking, you are still moving forwards. And I think like, that's what I really wanted to try and carry and capture in this. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to ask you about your decision to make the story like an embedded narrative where, you know, you're not yeah. just playing as a character in a story. You you're start out as one character, Zubari, who has lost his father. And then you jump into a story that his dad is was writing. And that's like where the more fantastical gameplay starts. So I'm, I'm super curious, like why you decided to structure it that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, that really came from the feeling of, um, you know, it was... <laughs> It was the sense of these two different time frames acts as two different perspectives towards death. One which is very heavily based in the reality of death, um, the finality of it in a way. Um, the sense of like, you know, I know for a fact that I can't talk to the god of death and ask him to bring my dad back, right? And the other world, which is very fantastical, almost very much like a if you could, um, you know, if there was a possibility. Because I think it was, again, important to depict this sense of, you know, with, with death and grief, it's, it's, it's quite a confusing event in life in the sense that it feels like, it doesn't feel like, um, it doesn't feel real, but it's also very real. And I think like, that's why I, why I wanted to kind of depict these two different perspectives, because one perspective is very much from the father's perspective, who, um, you know, the late father's perspective, who is who is a writer, who is, a, you know, trying to, <clears throat> you know, kind of creatively convey his feelings through through this book. And the other perspective is through, and, you know, is, is through the lens of a child or, you know, to, of a kid who is not, you know, the only way they can really understand it is by jumping into these fantastical worlds and kind of playing, you know, playing through it that way. And they're trying to communicate with one another through that. And that's why um, I wanted to set it in these two different, two different time frames is because it's to show these two different perspectives, these two different communications that are happening that aren't necessarily verbal. Yeah, I think that's that definitely comes through like to the player too, because you do see like the counterpoint of um, you know, when you start out in the beginning and then you kinda like go back at different points in the game versus like the setting when you're playing as Zhao, like the shaman. And I love how you mm -hmm. kinda like see echoes from like, you know, things you see like in his room or um like like yeah ornaments that they have and things like that and you kind of see like echoes of that in the actual like realm of the game which i think is is really really cool also i think it kind of like whenever you have that sort of like story within a story it's sort of i feel like it kind of like primes the viewer to be a little bit more like aware of like any potential like parables or kind of like symbolism yeah. that might be going on so i really definitely like enjoy that yeah and again it was a decision which you know I remember a lot of the time think, um, you know, talking to the team about it and they were like, no, we should just focus on, on Zhao because Zhao is the main game that you're, you're, you're playing as, right? Um, you know, Zhao, Zhao is the character you're going to be spending 90% of the time of. Why, why go anywhere else? And I just, you know, I remember just saying like, no, because it's, a, it's, it's, in a, this is as important. It's, a, it's, it's a vehicle that needs to kind of be conveyed because again, the, the complexities of grief are vast. So you need these two completely polar opposite sort of worlds in order to show how timeless grief is, because that is what grief is. It's timeless. It, it doesn't, it doesn't discriminate in, in that sense. It, it, it will affect anyone and everyone. So, you know, a good way of depicting that is by setting the game in two different spaces. You mentioned Kalunga, the god of death. I did want to ask you about his characterization too, because I think like other mythologies, their depictions of like gods of death, you know, they tend to be like a little bit more menacing or scary. Like yeah. a lot of times they're like cunning and they're, they're trying to like deceive you. But Kalunga is very different. You know, he's, he's more like a mentor and he has like much more of like a softer comforting presence at times. So I'm just kind of curious like where that comes from. Is that all from like the mythology, the mythology of like Bantu tales or is there like some other things that you added to that? Yeah, it's. I mean, like when when I was doing research into it and 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 looking at Kalunga as as, as as the god of death, you realize the similarities of like Kalunga is not only the god of death, but it's also a place, a bit like Hades. 
but the way that Ikalunga has been depicted in a lot of tales and, and with a lot of people is they're very human. They're very much like, you know, they have their flaws. They, you know, they have their sort of their issues, even though they have these incredible powers, you know, Kalunga is a, is a being that has, has their own domain yet is also afraid of man in some stories. And I think like, you know, for me, there was, there was that human aspect, that very human element of it that made me think like, yeah, the, the Kalunga is here to teach is to to cut and guide is always part of life, which, you know, is very different. It's, it's, they, they're not necessarily selfish. There's no selfishness there. They just are. And I think like that's what really made me, that inspired me to create the character of Kalunga the way that, the way that it is. Yeah. And I think um, like the banter between him and Zhao, I love how it's like always present as you're playing the game, even when you're doing like mm. difficult platforming mm. sections or exploring, it kind of makes the game feel like it never stops telling its story it's always like yeah it's, it's always present which i really really like and the thing is it's like you know with death it's like death is always ever present with us it's like so you got to find a way of laughing you got to find the funny element of it all you know it, it's it's like going on a journey with someone who's miserable why would you want to do that you know and i think like you know death is death and even in our in our in, in today's world it is always ever present it's everywhere and it's it's heavy it's hard and i think but the way that we cope with it is by either joking or just doing things or just, you know, kind of moving forward. Our, our mortality is always there. We just are, we're able to not think about it as much as, and, and, and play on it as much as we should. When it comes to like the world of like Bantu culture and mythology and tales and all that stuff, like what aspects of that really excited you in terms of like exploring like stories within that world and also like converting that into like a game mm. so so the, the the beautiful thing about bantu tales is that it's a very it's very much an ori ori <laughs> the beautiful thing about bantu tales is very much that it's an oral storytelling tradition um the fact that you you know these are stories that are predominantly orally told they're shared they're never really written and what that does is it gives the the storyteller the power to add their flavors, their flex of, of personality to it. And that to me was really cool because it gives like, you know, it's, it's almost like playing a dungeon master, um, you know, in D and D. And so, you know, for me, it was, it was one of those ones where, yeah, you don't really necessarily see much of, you know, many, um, Bantu stories being told uh, in in, the, in a game medium or even in, in, on TV to, to to begin with, so to get have the opportunity to be able to do that was really exciting because again you know these are kind of the tales and stories that I grew up on you know to share that was going to be really really cool, but you know to have that freedom of of being able to tell these mythical stories these stories that are you know myths are there to kind of teach us to or guide us you know in a way as, as humans but have the freedom to play and add our own flavor. That was something that I really wanted to add and, and kind of and carry forward in the same way that I wanted, you know, the book that Suberi reads also to kind of have that flavor of like, ah, this is my father telling me the story. This isn't necessarily based on a myth that actually exists, or it could be, it's just the way that my father is kind of depicting that myth. So that's why, I, you know, there's a lot of freedom of play, whereas it's different with like, when you look at Greek myth or, or Nordic myth, where the myths are, are final, you know? Um, Zeus will always be, for example, um, you know, the king of the gods in a way. Um, whereas, you know, as I said, like with Kalunga, Kalunga is, you know, in some, in some elements, he is the actual god of death, but in some elements, he is a place. He isn't both. You know, and I think like that's what's really cool about that. For people who, you know, were very interested in playing um, in the Bantu like tales from playing this game, do you have any like recommendations if they want to like pursue that world more? Are there like books or like other pieces of media where they can go and kind of get more of that? Yeah, I'd, there's, there's a fantastic book called Indaba, uh, My Children, which is by Credo Mutua, which is a fantastic entry into the sort of tales and, and legends specifically of looking at south african sort of zulu um you know osa uh tales but that's a great way of kind of giving you an idea of the world in which these legends and myths the creation myths and everything like kind of exist in evolved i think like that is like you know it's it's a wild book 
but like it's really really cool as a as a as a as a starting point in the by my children yeah were there any other like books or other like maybe pieces of media that like really inspired you for for this game and in the writing of it specifically yeah i think you know the thing is it's like it's it's funny like i you know, I'm I'm very much of the generation that grew up with like you know Lord of the Rings, uh, Pokemon, like Dragon Ball Z. So like I really wanted to kind of create these awesome worlds that um, I loved as a kid. And so you know, when it came to pulling from inspiration for for all this stuff, it was the, it was it was those stuff. You know, I was pulling a lot from there. Um, and mixing it with my own emotions because you know they always say like at the end of the day you got to write what you know right um and to me that was that's never resonated so true here in the sense of like i wanted to depict grief in an in an, in an honest fashion at the same time i wanted to have fun while doing it and that's essentially where we got to in the end so yeah i'd say like you know Things like Discworld was a really big inspiration for me as well. Um, you know, uh, The Cry of Ice Mark, which was this book that really resonated with me, which was about this, this you know, this young girl princess in a way who had a lot of responsibility thrown at them. You know, just Kingdom Hearts uh, as well. And now another book about, I don't know, not even a book, sorry, a game about um, a young man who is again thrown into a world of responsibility. Like, these all are big inspirations for me in regards to kind of crafting and conjuring uh, Zhao. And I just try to pick and, and pull bits like, you know, and ask myself, what is it about it that really excites me? And how do I reflect that in this? When you first had the idea for this and you did decide that you wanted to make it a game, like what what were the first steps? Did you start with like a script? Did you, did you have a, any other kind of like documentation? I started with a scene and the scene was essentially Zhao talking to death and asking death for this, for this task, uh, to, you know, to go to, to, to bring his father back. And, you know, I, and from that scene, this conversation between the boy and death, then came the questions of like, okay, what does the boy look like? What's the boy's name? Um, you know, who, you know, what does death look like? You know, how is death? And, it sort of spiraled that way. And I remember then sending like character briefs to artists, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, um, uh, in Botswana, like being like, hey, can you depict this? Um, can you, you know, show me a, a rendition of this, of, of what this, you know, this kid looks like or what this world looks like or where the space looks like? There are these elements. And, and from building from that, I then react back. And it's this, this it's action and reaction. And I think I take that a lot from being an actor. Um, and especially liking improv, the idea of having to yes and all the time. Like I was yes anding essentially throughout this whole process. And, you know, then came the idea of, you know, finding the team to build and, you know, to build the team, like the designers, the producers, the, the, uh, the, the artists, uh, the, 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 the coders. And it was this, just the process of constantly yes anding being like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And let's move on. And like, oh, that works. Yeah. And, or, oh, yeah, that doesn't work, but let's try this. You know what I mean? And like, it's just, it was that back and back and forth thing that really sort of spiraled into what created this game. Yeah, you mentioned like it's such an iterative process. Um, were there any like significant changes that happened as far as like the story structure and how it was going like while you're in development and also like how, I, th I think you did have like writers on this as well. I'm, I'm curious like how that was sort of like managed and organized and like what was the process for like? I think we started big, you know, we, we had so many more NPCs, so many more characters, so many more stories. And like, it was like, it was huge. And what, what we ended up having to do is, which is a very natural process in anything, I think anything creative, is you then begin to refine, you figure out what is it actually that you want to tell? What is the story that you want to tell? Pull back, pull back, keep pulling back. So then you can really find that, that core and deliver on that core, because that's ultimately what's important. It's that core element of, of, of the story of what you want to deliver. So there was a lot of changes that we had to make, you know, through it all. I mean, as I say, like we have so many more characters, so many more uh, stories, so many more systems in, in play that were, again, reflective of the journey of grief, but it almost felt like with the amount that we had, it detracted from the actual story and, and potency of that. 
you know, it's like diluting juice in a way. You know, you don't want to dilute it too much, but you don't want it to be so strong that it, it's the only thing you can taste, you know? Uh, I'm curious, like, what were some of the big lessons that you learned throughout this process that you might, um, you know, employ uh, with future projects? And also for people who are also, like, looking to make that plunge, if they have, like, a really great yeah. idea that they're excited about, like, what advice or where do you think they should start in terms of, like, starting that journey? Trust people <laughs> you know one of the things that i learned was essentially like you've got to listen to people man you don't know everything you don't know all the answers i think there is something you know a company is, is a company of people it's a group of people and development in any form or shape is it's it's about listening to others and i think like that was something that um you know i i i i'd learned very early on and i'm happy i did because you know, development hell and nightmare and things not moving forward is when you think that you have all the answers and, and you put it on your shoulders. Whereas actually, if you share that with the people who and you know that you've all got that common goal of wanting to get to the same place, that's where the power is. I think you kind of touched on this already, but I'm curious, like, how does your experience as like an actor, a voice artist, how did that kind mm. of inform your... I guess sensibilities as like a writer and a game director. You know, the thing about acting is is it's it's as I say, it's a lot of reacting. So I was reacting a hell of a lot um to the people that I was working with. And and it's it's about listening. And I think like that is such a gift. You know, you good actors listen. And I think like that's something that um whenever you see a performance and you see, you know, actors reacting, it's because they're really they're taking it in and they're reacting to the to the character in the moment. Every time you try and react, um, if you try and plan how you're going to react, it doesn't work. So for me, it was like I wanted to take that as well and reflect that in a in a company, in a studio space. You know, being a good leader, it's listening. It's like you know, kind of reacting on that front. And so that's sort of what really helped. And then when it came to you know, I, I know that whenever I receive scripts and 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 stories, like I want to know where I'm going. I want to know what the plan is, even if it changes at the end, I still kind of want to have an idea. And so having some form of vision that's very clear is, was really important. You know, yeah, of course, you'll discover things on the way. But like, for me, I've found the best, the best directors that I've worked with, and the best kind of other actors that I've worked with, we have an idea of where we're going with it. And the exciting bit then is like, how do we get to the in inevitable? You know, what's that journey there? And that's so then that's sort of also what I kind of wanted to carry on with the team in creating and crafting this game. As far as more stories, since it's called Tales, are you like planning to do anything else within that, you know, that world? Like yeah, I think so again, for me, like I designed Tales of Kinzera to be a world in which it's about human truth. It's about the human story. And, and that's something that I wanted to kind of keep doing. Obviously, it's set within the world of Kinzera, and I've got a whole plan and an idea with it. And that's what's been really good fun as well with working with people like Critical Role. You kind of, you know, they've built these and conjured these incredible universes and worlds that you can dive into. And that's something that I, you know, wanted to to learn from. And so, like, yeah, Tales of Kinzera is, is only just, you know, it's, it's, it is it is it's a universe that I want to kind of keep jumping back into, telling these very human stories that kind of span across different time frames as well. You know, what do you think is like that special sauce in games that makes them so effective at, you know, communicating different types of stories? I think it's 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 about respecting the medium. man. Like I do like I think like with with especially with games, like put it this way, if 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 I wanted to tell a good story, like a very, you know, powerful story, for example, um, and just just the story. I should do it as a book or like as a TV show or as a film. But the experience that I wanted to share was one that, yes, definitely the story was going to you know, play a big part in that, but it had to be felt and it had to be kind of experienced. It had to be held. And so I had to respect the medium of the game. I had to respect the gameplay. I had to respect the mechanics. I had to respect the system and lay story within that. By marrying both these things, that's how you're able to convey really powerful storytelling and stories. I think, you know, another really good example of of, 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 of something that's done that or a game that's done that I feel is uh, 
The Last of Us. And, you know, when you start the game, you, you, you start as, as a character, you start as the character in which, um, is like your main character who you think, you know, you're going to be, you know, you, even though you know, it isn't necessarily, but you think that this character, um, is, is essentially like you're, you're taking control of someone who is going to mean a hell of a lot and is the kind of the instigator to the reasons as to why this, why the, we are, we are telling the story and why we're focusing on this, on, on this specific, you know, journey. You can't do that anywhere else. And I think like, that's what made the last of us so brilliant and powerful the survival story because you play as someone at the beginning who doesn't survive and i feel like that is what's been really really why i really respect the medium of games and the power of games of telling stories because they can they can do something if you respect the medium enough you can you can do things that don't necessarily which can't be done anywhere else I totally agree. I, there are different mediums that can like play around with like point of view, but I feel like within a game world, it it, it like there's just so many more tools at your disposal to kind of like communicate that. Um, I think like yeah, The Last of Us is a great example. I think also in like the newer God of War um, games, they mm. kind of play with that idea too. Like I know there's this like funny moment. Uh, I think in Ragnarok where like I think like Kratos every time he like opens a chest he like smashes it with his fist yeah. and then when you play as like atreus he tries to like open it like he tries to do the same thing he like hurts his hand yeah, or something like that yeah. Like... yeah 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 it's great oh is there a book or other like comic book maybe or graphic novel that you think would make an amazing game oh man dude oh don't get me started um i'm waiting for spawn man i'm waiting for a spawn game dude like I'm like I'm so ready for. Okay, I think Spawn is such a really cool character, and such a cool sort of also world that he 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 encompasses and and lives in. Like to see that as a video game would be really really dope. And I'd say like you know, um, I think it's funny. Like I was thinking this the other day. I think like even with like Game of Thrones, I don't know if that could actually ever be a game. I think it really works as a story. I mean, like, yeah, of course you can you can pull aspects and elements, and I'm sure they have made games of it. But there is something about I don't know. It's it's funny because I was I was having this thought of like, oh, what would make a really good game, and what wouldn't, right? And sometimes I feel like there are there are elements that are so rich and so powerful and so potent in spaces in which they live in you know for example like a book or or even like a tv show that the idea of trying to translate that into a game might not necessarily work but i would you know i, I know i've kind of gone off the the question of what you asked because but it, it, it's that whole thing of like you know as i say like you've got to respect the medium right and i think adaptions are an interesting one because adaptions nine times out of ten they have been adapted to that format because they wanted to respect that medium like i could never imagine for example zao being a tv show or a um or or a book um or even a comic it had to be a game now maybe you know coming at a different angle could be you know or a different character then you design it that way but to kind of take it like you know as as is and try and you know put it somewhere else it would be very difficult to so even when i say something like spawn the thing about spawn is like it's about the character and the character is a lot more easier to adapt into a different medium than necessarily um the politics the relationships of characters in a book you know and i feel like that's kind of where my head is out on the whole front yeah i love spawn uh i actually had i think i had like the first 50 issues when it came out originally um yeah, such a unique and like really dark story I, I totally agree that would be an amazing game there's something about like him becoming more him getting like more of his like hell powers is also like kind of making him farther and farther away from his humanity there's kind of like an interesting like dichotomy there they could maybe explore so you did mention game of thrones and i did want to ask you a few questions if you can about House of the Dragon season two. When you get on board with a project like that, and um, we actually published George R. R. Martin's books, so I'm kind of curious, like when you're preparing for a character, like is there a conversation like, oh yeah, you should read this book to see kind of like where your character is going, or do they deliberately try to like not have that sort of cloud your your um, I guess your mm. process? For for us or for me anyway, 
it was very open. Like, you know, we, it, it was, it was my choice to essentially read the books, but I wasn't necessarily told that I had to, you know, I think like, again, as an actor, your job is really to depict what's on the script and tell it in its most honest and, and purest way. Obviously there's a lot of research that you can do, like depending if you're playing someone who actually really existed in, in real life or, or, you know, if the world itself is already established, like there is bits you can do and you, you know, you know, some people should, some people, you don't have to, but like, yeah, I think with, with, with Game of Thrones, it's a funny one because, or Songs of Ice and Fire, like it's, it's, you know, a lot of people, I'd say its universe was established through the visual medium, right? Um, so that already sets its, it's, 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 it's like, ev I'd like everyone, everyone and their brother and their sister have probably watched some form or aspect of Game of Thrones, right? Um, so there's already an, an element of like what that is and that what that kind of means. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm aware of this world. I know of this universe. It's useful to kind of see the visual medium and what that you how that universe is depicted because I'm going to be playing in that. But anything else extra is going to be great. You know, the books carry this fantastic tone and and sense of um, magic about them that informs so much of the characters of which you play because you learn at the end of the day it is just a fam family drama like it's you know if you take away the dragons take away the throne take away all the kind of elements of 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 of, of wizardry or magic around it right it is ultimately a family drama and that is so much you know it's 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 even strengthened through the books as well and i think like that at its core is is where you want to play because if you you know a lot of the time you think oh yeah it's got dragons so fantasy and you're like actually no it's it's nothing to do with fantasy man like that's just a a secondary element to it all truly this is about people and i think like that's what's been that's what's been really that's what's been hammered into us you know from the get go which has been really really fun i think that comes through a lot in the in the television show both game of thrones and house of the dragon as people a lot of people might know like fire and blood it's not really like a kind of book where you get like scenes and stuff it's yeah it's like a, it's, it's just like historical entries i think the showrunners did a great job and the writers like really like what you said like really focusing on like the family relationships you get like so many more scenes with like fathers talking to daughters mothers talking to their children and you really can kind of get a better sense of like the motivation and a lot of like i think like tragic irony that kind of like follows through the proceedings, I guess. It's just, I, I think it's so cool, man. Like I'm, I've, I've been something that I'm, I'm, I'm also, you know, kind of taking on board, especially with the stories that I want to tell and the stories that I kind of want to jump into. It's like, yeah, it's all good, great and good having the flashy, you know, kind of big elements of it all, you know, the, the sort of the, the explosions, the dragons, the, the, the madness, but you know, really, again, the things that it, it excite me, it's like, yeah, but what is it really about? You know, like, even, I'm a massive, you know, Dungeons and Dragons player, right? Um, and the best campaigns I've had have been ones about relationships, you know, and, and played. And like, you know, I've been about the relationships rather than necessarily the epic save the world sort of thing, you know? So since you mentioned you did read the books, I'm curious, like, is there anything specific that you can talk about in terms of the character you play, Alan of Hull, that you're, like, really excited or that you were really excited to kind of, like, explore? Yeah, I'm just, I, I think I'm excited to explore this. Again, as I said, like, it's all about family. And to play a character where I feel like family is incredibly important to them, especially with the relationship with their brother. And, you know, there is, you know, with that love that I have for Adam, for example, to then, there is also then that gap of where that, where the father's, you know, where the father's love should be, or, you know, even the mother to a degree. It's mainly that I'm looking at the father, essentially. I'm excited to sort of explore and expand that. And, you know, because what, you know, what the character, what Alan has anyway, just in, in the kind of way that I've sort of kind of approached him is that he has so much love to give, so much love. And he has been subject, he's been told, or, you know, he's kind of told himself that he, he, he's not allowed that. 
And I think that's what's been really kind of exciting to play and really kind of dive into. And, you know, within the books as well, the journey of of where, you know, Alan sort of gets to, there is a sense of like, that's just redirected love and energy of love and suppressed love and what that does to the psyche of a man. And I think like that's why I, what I really wanted to kind of conjure when jumping into this world on, on TV. Yeah, it sounds great. I'm really excited to see like where they take his character. I know in like these big TV shows, like they're very concerned about like leaks and stuff like that. Like how much notice do you get before you actually start shooting? Do you like get a script? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like nothing, dude. I mean, like they are like so... It's not that like you don't get any notes or anything like that. You do get a few, but and it's, look, and it's, it's both the positive and negative because there's the positive elements is that it allows you the freedom to create and play, um, and you know gives you the freedom to actually explore. Obviously, the negative is like you're constantly thinking, "Am I doing this right?" <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, not really much, man. It's it's a pretty locked down tight. That's so interesting to me because I feel like, at least definitely in the scene that we saw in, in episode one, it feels like there's a mm. lot of like, there's a lot of undertones going on, like with like the things yeah. that you say to each other. And I, I was just kind of curious, yeah. like, is that kind of stuff communicated to you in advance? Or are you kind of yeah, like, I mean, like that yourself? You, you definitely, yeah, you definitely work with the director in regards to finding that stuff. But like, I feel like you're also working with the other actor and reacting to them and you know playing them that you're also taking your own research and your own baggage and kind of pulling in that so and the, you know the beauty of this production is that they give you time to explore and play you're doing so many takes of the same scene and you you're trying something new something different and then most of the magic really is conjured in the editing room. And that's where they capture another way of telling and depicting that story. And I think like that's why these scenes are so powerful in this show, man. And they just go through it's because they conjure it in the editing room, man, and allow you the time to play. Is there a lot of thought and discussion about like just what kind of accent you use for that character? Or is that something you kind of like come up with on your own? I'm curious how that process works. Yeah, I mean like there is there is elements, there is part there are points of it and parts of it. You do have a you do have like a say in regards to how the character's gonna either, you know, how they're gonna look, how they're gonna be depicted, how they're gonna you know, the play, the voice, all this sort of stuff. There is this dialogue that happens between you and, and the team. But again, I think we're all discovering it as we go along, you know? Um, and, you know, choices, for example, of, of costumes and, and, and looks are a lot, you know, led by the showrunner. But at the end, you know, but also there is a freedom of like, you know, the hair and makeup artists or like the, um, the uh, you know, the dialogue coach, for example, how you're going to say elements like, you know, my lord or, or, or lord, like all those kind of elements, like those little details. It's a team, it's a group effort, you know, so there is the conversations of that as well. Did you feel left out at all because you didn't get a fancy wig? <laughs> to be honest, not really. I like because again, like you're kind of brought into um, you're brought in to do the thing that you do good at, right? Which is you know you read a script and to be able to depict that and and say it in a way. So as long as you can focus on the elements that you're that you feel st the strongest in, you don't necessarily feel left out on the other elements <laughs> and stuff that that, that that kind of come through and play. Yeah, totally. I think I I saw an interview with Matt Smith and he was saying like I think he said like his wig took like two or three hours to like do like every day. So maybe you lucked out in that regard. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's honestly, man. You know what's funny? It's filming and 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 this 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 element these 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 places of storytelling. It's it's so it's so surreal. It's and, and such a joy because you are literally just being a kid, man. You're being a giant kid. And there is nothing cooler than, you know, imagining that your stick is a sword and that your dustbin lid's a shield and, you know, saying it with all conviction that you're going to, you know, you're the king of the castle. Have you done like mocap where you're like in like a green screen? Yeah, I've done, I've done mocap, yeah. Awesome, yeah. I'm curious like how that environment compares to like when you're on like this massive set where like everything is tangible um mm. is, is one easier yeah. than the other like i find a lot more freedom 
in motion capture than I do actually, funnily enough, on film and TV. Because in film and TV, everything looks so real. So you are anchored by the realities of what you are playing off. Now, it makes you, it makes it easier to kind of lose yourself in the world. But, you know, you can never imagine the chair, for example, will always be that chair, will always look like that chair. Whereas with motion capture, a lot of, it, it requires a lot of imagination and a lot of play. And by tapping into that source, it then allows you to kind of be a lot more free. And, you know, when I was doing Assassin's Creed Origins, for example, it was just so freeing and so kind of like open to play because Egypt could, my Egypt looked, you know, it was my Egypt to kind of play in rather than necessarily an Egypt that was created and will always look like the Egypt it does. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I want to go back and play uh, Origins again. It's been a while. That was actually one, that's one of my favorite Assassin's Creed games. It's a great game, man. Yeah, I didn't have any other questions. Um, thank you so much. Also, I know like you know you're probably very busy, so we really appreciate you taking out the time. Um, yeah, was there anything else that you wanted to mention or talk about, or anything like you wanted to plug? No, or anything man. Like, that? like this was. I'm just really thankful we did this. So thank you so much, and thank you for understanding as well. Like I'm, I'm in the middle of you know I'm in LA at the moment, so it's it's been it's a, it's different from being at home at my desk. But I appreciate I just appreciate you know being asked to come on board and, and talk about this stuff because I love it. Awesome. Yeah, no, we appreciate it too.